Welcome to another episode of the Drew Pearson Show. We're coming to you live tonight from Kelly's right here in Allen. We've been here before and we're back by popular demand. And what a great place this is. Great food, great drinks, and great people. What more do you want? And you even got the Drew Pearson Show coming to you live tonight right here from Kelly's. And we got a great lineup for you tonight on the Drew Pearson Show. And I'll get into that in just a minute. Let's talk a little Cowboy football. You know it was a tough weekend for the Dallas Cowboys, learning about the death of one of their teammates, Jerry Brown Jr., who was killed in a car accident. And the car was driven by another Dallas Cowboy, Josh Brandt, who was now, at that point, starting for the Dallas Cowboys for the injured Jay Ratliff. What a tragic accident. What a tough deal for the Dallas Cowboy football team to go through and deal with. Jason Garrett handled it like a pro. There's a lot of things I compare Jason Garrett to with Coach Landry and his demeanor, the way he handles things, the way he handles his press conference, and all those kind of things. And another reason I compare Jason Garrett to Coach Landry is the way he handled this negative situation where he had to present to his team what had happened the night before, before they got on a plane to head to Cincinnati to play that most important football game against the Cincinnati Bengals. Tom Landry would have handled that just the same way as Jason Garrett handled it. It's a very tough situation, very delicate situation. And the thing about it, there's no case study. There's nothing to fall back on, on how to handle a situation like that. But now, because of the way Jason Garrett handled that situation, we have something in the NFL lures to fall back on in case a situation like this, God forbid, ever happens again. And I was really proud of the way the Dallas Cowboys football team stepped up and played the game of their life for Jerry Brown so that they could win that football game, carry that jersey off the field, take that game ball, and be able to give it to Jerry Brown's mother after that football game. Just a tremendous performance by the Dallas Cowboys using that negative situation to bring the team together in a, in a situation where the chemistry of that team was going to be hard to beat by the Bengals. And you saw what happened when we were down nine points going into that last quarter. We get a touchdown from Dez. Now we're only down three points. And then all of a sudden, you know, we get the ball back. How do we get it back? Our defense finally got to stop to get that ball back for us, and we were able to drive it down for the game-winning field goal by Dan Bailey to help us win that most important football game for the Dallas Cowboys. Now these guys have to regroup and get ready to take on the Pittsburgh Steelers because their playoff hopes are still alive, and that's what it's all about. Also with the Dallas Cowboys today, it's a very sad day for Dallas Cowboy football nation because one of our own, uh, former number 54, uh, with the Dallas Cowboys, Gene Lockhart, was sentenced today to four and a half years in federal prison for his role in a mortgage fraud case. I was in the court along with Randy White and some of the other former great Cowboys to support Gene and to hear that verdict go down today was very disheartening. We always thought Gene was a stand-up guy. He got caught up into something that he had no business being in, first of all, because he had no knowledge of what was going on up and above his head. So now he's got to pay the consequences for that. And let's all Cowboy Nation put our hands together for Gene Lockhart and pray that he'll come out of this a better person than he went in to this situation. So we hope that works out. Now our lineup tonight for the Drew Pearson Show, we got a great one for you. We got the mayor of Frisco, Texas, the booming metropolis of Frisco, Texas. Mayor Masso is with us tonight, and we'll find out what some of the great things they got going on in the city of Frisco. We also have an Olympic gold medalist in the house with us tonight, Jeremy Werner, who's won Olympic gold medal in the 400 meter dash. He competed in Olympics in 2004, 2008, and now he's getting ready to compete one more time in the Olympics coming up. And he's got some great things to tell us about his training and what he's doing to prepare for the next Olympics. Also, we got the great Randy White, Hall of Famer, Ring of Honor, one of the best teammates that I ever had the privilege of playing with. He's in the house tonight and he's gonna tell us what he's been doing with his life after football and we'll have an opportunity to get caught up with the great Randy White. What's his nickname? Manster. Half man, half monster. I hope he leaves the monster part home tonight because I've seen that part of the Randy White and I like the manster, the man part 
a lot better. My co-host Paul Salfin has great movie reviews and he's going to get into that with you and we're going to get all of this started next right here at Kelly's for the Drew Pearson Show. Stay tuned. show what a great show we have here tonight at Kelly's restaurant right here in Allen Texas at the shops of Allen right across the street from the Allen Event Center what a great place come on out and see us if you're not here with us tonight come visit this great facility great restaurant great drinks great food as well and now this portion of the show we're joined by Mayor Masso who is the mayor of the city of Frisco, Texas, a booming metropolis. As we all know, they just hired a new superintendent yep. and all that, got a lot going on in the city of Frisco. And Mayor, thanks for being with us to let us in on what's happening up there in Frisco. Well, Drew, thanks for having me. It's such a beautiful place. Allen's a great community. Mayor Terrell and the council done a great job out here, but you're absolutely right. Things are happening in Frisco. It's growing and that last census had us as the fastest growing city in the country. So. You come there last year, come here this year, it's completely different. It's really booming now. How big, or as far as population, is Frisco right now? Well, we're going to hit 130,000 this year. So, and put that in perspective, in 2000, Drew, we were 32,000. Wow. So it's grown a little bit. And you mentioned the superintendent, Dr. Reedy, who just retired. Yes. What an amazing job. He came on in the school district. I think we had about five schools in our main school district. He's retiring with 56 schools. So in that short time period, they opened a whole bunch of schools. Something in the water, we don't know what it is. People are having babies out there. <laughs> <laughs> there is something in the water. And uh, you're supporting how many high schools now in Frisco? Well, I, uh, I believe, we have, yeah, we have six high schools wow. and number seven's under construction. Wow. So and in 2002, we had one high school. Amazing, yeah. and they're all 4A high schools, yeah, so yeah. they're not small yeah. schools. You also got some other great things going on in the city coming up. Uh, a football championship. Yeah, Tell sure. us about that. Sure, we're, we're actually, Frisco is home for the NCAA Division I football championship, the FCS subdivision, and uh, it's exciting. It's the only real playoff systems. These kids, you know, and if you saw, I think you saw them last year, yes. you know, they work their way there. They have to go through a playoff system, 20 teams. Uh, from 22 conferences and 122 colleges, comes down to 20 teams, goes through the bracket, and now we're down in the semifinals. Four teams are left. Wow. North Dakota State, Ooh. which was there last year. Yeah. Sam Houston State, All which right. was there Texas, last year. Yeah. yeah, Texas. Representing. That's right. And then we have uh, Eastern Washington, who actually was in the first championship game in Frisco. And the, the last team is Georgia Southern. So. This yeah. weekend, Friday and Saturday, there's gonna we're gonna be down to the final two. Well, I'm gonna predict Eastern Washington, okay, because the Kyle Pardon from uh, South Lake High School uh -huh. is the quarterback up there after he transferred from SMU. Is that correct? That's right. And then, uh, of course, Sam Houston State. We so got a Southland Conference. We got a root for them yeah, as well. We have make to it, make it a a, a Texas flavor yeah. for that game. How did you get that? And did you? Uh, solicit that or did they come to you for that championship Oh, we game? definitely solicited that. We had a lot of help. In fact, Emmett Smith was there at that first meeting we had with him. Right Took on. the directors out to dinner of the NCAA and, you know, he said, you're comparing Frisco to who again? Yeah. A great man, great man helped yeah, us how out. Could they turn down how Emmett? could they turn down <laughs> Emmett, right? Yeah. All time leading Emmett rusher in that. NFL history. A absolutely. You can't say no to Emmett, that's, that's for you sure. You know, we have you out here. It, it's yeah. who can turn down the Metroplex? You know, right. have Allen and Frisco and Plano and Dallas. What, what a great community. I think uh, you heard this, the Men's Journal named Frisco a few years ago as the number one place to raise an athlete. Is that right? Yeah, there you go, we just added to that. Well, I better have my daughter and her boys move to Frisco. There you so go. <laughs> we can get them to be top athletes as well. That's right. And uh, you got the game going on there and the growth of the city. What's next for Frisco? Where do you go from here? 
Well, you know, Drew, we, we're 50% built out, so we, we think we'll end up around 280 to 300,000. But we're going to get there very quickly. We're adding about 1,500 new homes a year. A lot of people moving there, a lot of companies, great place to live. And it's really indicative of all the cities in North Texas. Uh, Allen's growing rapidly, Plano, uh, McKinney, they're all doing really well. What's next? You know, it's a great quality of life, great education system, and sports. Uh, yeah. We're not done with sports. You know, we're home for the Dallas Stars headquarters and practice facility, uh, Rough Riders, AA Rangers affiliate, the Texas Legends, right. Donnie Nelson. Yes. You know, we, we have the FC Dallas Stadium where FC Dallas plays, and that's where the NCAA game is played. You know, we have gymnastics, we have hockey, the Texas Tornado. We're adding to that. We're not done yet. It's just a, one more thing to add to. Yeah, you need one more thing. And yeah. that's football. So there. when are you going to so open up a team there? Some Grant? indoor football. There we go. Right indoor there. football. Right on. But, uh, you know, they all say you build the facilities and they will come. You know, you mentioned the uh, great things you guys are doing in education on the residential side and that. But what about the business side? You seem to be attracting a lot of business to Frisco as well. Sure. We're doing two things. First, what you said about you build it, they'll come. You know, one of the things we noticed in Frisco, it's really not about the buildings. It's really about the people. You know, look what you've done. Look yes. at the special things you've done. Look at, look at Donnie Nelson and what he's done with the legends. And yeah. It's really about the quality people we have out here. Buildings, anybody can build buildings. You put the right people doing the right thing, things they love and they're passionate about. World Olympic Gymnastics, Carly Patterson, Nastia Lukin, coaches that love what they do. It's really about the people. But you, you hit on a good point. You know, we have to have the businesses that support that. Right. People move here for jobs. And then I just returned from Austin. I, I am actually appointed by the governor on the Economic Development Committee for the state of Texas. And North Texas is creating jobs. Frisco is creating jobs. We're so successful, we're actually running out of office space, so we gotta get some more <laughs> office buildings up. Wow. It's a great problem to have. Amen, yeah. amen. Now what about you personally? This is, you're into your second term, yeah. that goes to 2014, that's, that's right. correct? Yeah. Does the future hold another term for Mayor you, Massa? You know, it's a little early. I've been on the council since 2000. You know how exciting it is to watch a community grow and have that meet good people like yourself? Yeah. It, it's been fun. So I don't know what 2014 will bring. I know I love doing this. I know I love being part of the community. A lot more left to do, so we'll see what when that time comes. But right now, I'm just you know it's a, such a privilege to be trusted and put in a position to really be part of this growth and part of the community. Yeah, I was going to say it must be really exciting for you to be leading this growth and spearheading it and bringing in the right people to support that growth. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do love doing it, but you know it's really important to know we have a great council, we have a city manager. You know, a little known fact, most people don't know this. What's that? City Council in Frisco, uh, it, you know, changes through elections, right? Sure. But we've only had one city manager since Frisco became a city in 1987, a home rule city, uh -huh. George Purefoy. We've never had wow. anybody else. Wow. So we've had that stability, so that's really unique. Yeah, you hear that, Dallas yeah. Cowboys? Yeah. Same thing over and over. That's what it takes. That's what it takes. All right, Mayor, we want to thank you for taking the time to be with us. Mayor Massimo. Masso. Masso. <laughs> Massimo. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm when giving you mayor, you get used to being called a lot of different things. I Drew. bet, I bet, <laughs> but never Massimo. <laughs> <No. laughs> mayor Masso from the city of Frisco, thanks for being with us. Drew. Coming up next on the Drew Pearson Show, we go from the mayor and and that political side to the sports side because we got an Olympic athlete in the house and he's going to be here on the Drew Pearson Show next. All right. All right. Welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. I told you, I told you I had an Olympic hero in the house from Lamar High School in Arlington, Arlington, Texas, Baylor University. Let's welcome the great Jeremy Warner to the Drew yeah. Pearson Show. All right, man. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. Appreciate it for having me. Man, I'm, we got you brought your medals. We got to get to this right away, man. Okay. First of all, explain what we got here. It's from Athens, 2004. So these are uh, my first two gold medals. Won these at the age of 20. Wow. Uh, I was actually the youngest 400 runner ever to win a gold medal in the Olympics until this year. Uh, the kid that won from Grenada, he's 19. 19, so wow. He, he, he broke that. Uh, so these two are pretty much my, the ones I I love the most. The cherish, huh? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you know, I worked real hard to get to this point. So this was your first Olympics, right? Yes, my first Olympics. And it's in Athens, Greece. How was that, a 20-year-old going to Athens, Greece to participate and compete 
in the 2004 Olympics. How was that? It was amazing. You know, it was my yeah. first international experience outside of the outside of the Caribbean. So to go over to Europe for the first time and not understand anything that's going on is different. Right. But you know, with the way we train, we train to stay stay focused on whatever we're doing. And with my coach Clyde Hart, I was able to do that. We were we were uh, trained as hard as we could while we were over there, and then you know everything just fell into place. Well, you mentioned Clyde Hart. We're going to get into him in a minute. But being over there in 2004, winning two goals, then you go back, right, in 08. 08. And you get the silver in the 400, right? And now a goal in the 4x4 four by, four by four. Four by four hundred relay. And tell us about that experience, because this was in Beijing. Yeah, it was, it was a totally different experience. Uh, Beijing was more prepared than Athens. Beijing had more money, so they went all out. The yeah. opening ceremonies, the closing ceremonies, the venues. Uh, so the experience was a whole lot different. Uh, I didn't do as much in Athens as I did in Beijing. I didn't do opening ceremonies there. Uh, so Beijing was my first one, and they just went crazy. It was yeah. the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And um, it was different because I was actually the reigning Olympic gold medalist coming in. And so I had a big target on my back. And coming into the race, I finally, my first time being beat was earlier that season. Uh, first time since I won in 08. So um, it was a little different. And unfortunately, I came out with the silver. And a lot of people would say that's an amazing experience. It is. Silver. It is. But in my eyes, I was real disappointed. Sure. Because uh, I had my heart set on the gold. And I worked so hard. And things happened. And uh, you know, I just started, had to move on after that. So you're 20 years old when you go to Athens in 04. Now you're 24 mm -hmm. in uh, Beijing. Was there a difference how you prepared for the race, the big race, the, the 400? No, no, not really. I mean, like I said, the way we prepare the same way, whether it's a local meet at home or it's the biggest meet in the, in the world, we, we prepare ourselves the same way, we train the same way. Um, we just take it day by day and we just work real hard. Now you mentioned training, you mentioned the great Clyde Hart, man. Everybody knows that. Even if you don't run track, you know his presence and what he's done for uh, the U.S. as far as track athletes are concerned out of Baylor University. And you mentioned training. Tell us what goes into training for a 400 meter. Because it, it used to be like, but now it's a sprint. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? Yeah. you know, it's loud. It's like the 100, the Definitely. 200, and the 400. They're yeah. all sprints now. Yeah, it's the best of both worlds. You know, yeah. you, got, you got the strength runners and you got the speed runners. And the quarter milers, some of them are, are the strength runners, some of them are the speed runners, but then you have a few of us that are able to have both. And I'm, one, I'm fortunately to be one of those. Um, and this training is it's the worst training that you can go through. I could imagine. Uh, 800 runners there, they, they do a lot of like repeat 400s and everything. But for us, in my eyes, I feel like the 400 training is even harder just because we got to go such faster, faster paces and less rest. And it's, just, it's brilliant. It's, I'm, I had workout earlier today and I'm sore right now as we speak. <laughs> I bet. So it's a little different. Uh, part of your training, is it all just running? Is it distance running, sprint running? Um, and then also, is weight training involved? Definitely. Weight training is involved. Um, when, I'm not, when I don't have a meet, we train. We lift uh, three days a week. When I have a meet, we break it down to two. And off-season, we do a lot more heavier weight. And then once we get into the season, we cut the weight down and we do faster reps and work on our fast twitch muscles and our explosion. Uh, as for the running training, in the off season we do a lot of over distance. We do uh, 20 minute runs, 30 minute wow. runs, thousands, uh, 12 200s. We start off with 15 200s and we work our way down as the season goes on. Yeah. And then once we're in the season, then we start doing the quicker stuff. We do 450s, 350s, 300s. That's to get our uh, get used to that lactic acid that builds mm -hmm. up. And uh, so off season work is a lot more. In, get our endurance and get our strength up. And once we hit the track, it's more getting our turnover. Yeah, you sound like you do a lot of endurance training <laughs> as part of your training. Yes, and yes. I know it, to be able to run that 400 effectively, but also be able to go through the heats mm -hmm. and all that, that leads to the finals, right? Yeah, we have, for us, the, it used to be four rounds at the 400 back in 96. Uh, and I think 2000 was the last year they did it. And they win the three rounds, so I'm fortunate to have only three rounds to go through. But for 
the Olympic trials that we have in the States, we have three rounds back to back. So we go Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So, we, and it's, it's not even 24 hours rest because sometimes we'll run Friday morning or Friday night, Saturday afternoon, and Saturday, Sunday afternoon. So it's, it, it, it's, it's, it hurts, yeah. but that's what we train for. That's what you got to do, right? That's yeah. the business. Yeah. And uh, again, you mentioned in training. Uh, what are you training for now and what's next for Jeremy Werner? Well, uh, we have world championships this summer in Moscow. Uh, wow. In August, and then of course I'm still going for the 2016 Olympics. Nice, nice. You're 28. When's it going to end for you? Well, hopefully not. <laughs> no, hopefully not. Uh, not in my mid 30s, but uh, I'm hoping that I, I can make it to six, 2016, and then uh, you know from that from there on I'll play it by year. Uh, take it one year at a time. And the competition just keeps getting better oh, and better, isn't definitely. it? Definitely. You know, now we have uh, three runners that are actively running right now. That's ran 43. It's the first time I think. It, since early 90s that we've had more than one person running 43 in a race. Wow, and you're injury free now? I'm injury free now, I'm stronger I'm stronger and faster, so I'm looking forward to, to the season to breaking out and get back into the 43s. Right on, well we're looking, 43? Yeah. Woo, 43s? I'm, I'm, That's like two. I'm, <laughs> I'm close to the world record, so wow. third fastest seven. Yeah, yeah, uh, Michael Johnson, right? Did you train with the great Michael Johnson he's at all? He's actually my age. Okay. So he, nice. his, his coach is Clyde, was Clyde Hall. Right, yeah. So you know, we uh, we talked about stories on his training, and I'm doing the same exact workouts he was doing. Coach Hart's been doing these these workouts these workouts for about 50 years. Amen. Amen. Well, we wish you the best, man, Thank and we you. appreciate you taking the time with us you, to be with us on the Drew Pearson Show, and we'll be following your career as you go on to the next Olympics and win some more of these. Yeah. They're gold medals, y'all. Give it up for Jeremy Ward. Four-time Olympic medalist, six-time world champion in the house right here at Kelly's. And we'll be back with more of the Drew Pearson Show with the great Randy White. Woo! All right, welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. This segment we got the great Randy White, but we want to thank Jeremy Warner, the great track athlete, for being with us. We wish him great success as he pursues another Olympic goal. But as I said, our guest now is the legendary number 54 with the Dallas Cowboys, drafted in 1975 in the first round, the second pick in that NFL draft from the University of Maryland. We call him affectionately the Manster, but you know him as Randy White. Welcome, Randy White, to the Drew Pearson Show. All right, right on, Randy. Thank you. Glad all to be right. here. Thanks for being with us. Oh, glad to be here. Uh, Randy, I guess first of all, we ask you, what is Randy White doing now? You look like you're in great shape. You look like you want to jack one of them Pittsburgh Steelers that are coming to town this weekend. What is well, Randy White doing I, now? I wish I still could play, Drew, but <laughs> unfortunately, you. the rally, reality of it is, I can't. So uh, you know, but I'm a Cowboy fan, and I'll cheer for him and. Uh, you know, I have a barbecue restaurant in Frisco, Texas. And, yes, uh, excellent barbecue, by the way. Uh, you know, I've, I've gotten back into making some custom knives. That's something I enjoy doing. I've started fishing a little bit again. Uh, I was involved with a couple business projects here in the last couple years, and so that slowed down. So now I'm going to start doing some things I like to do. I hear you. Well, one thing you like to do is work out. You stay in shape. What kind of workouts are you doing now? To stay in great that, shape. That's something I've always done is, is work worked out. I mean, my workouts have changed over the, over time. Now I just do a maintenance type workout four days a week. I'll, I work out doing my uh, the weights, and I don't lift heavy weights anymore. It's lighter weights, more repetitions, and then you know I still stay involved with my martial arts stuff and still do a little training with that. Uh, you know, I try to do that three or four days a week just to keep my cardio up and keep my hand-eye coordination, keep everything going, but uh, it's getting tougher and tougher as I get a little <laughs> older, Drew, trust me. I bet, Randy. Uh, tough weekend uh, last weekend for the Dallas Cowboys with the tragedy of Josh Brent and Jeremy Brown. What is your reflections on as you think about that and watch that team play uh, uh, against Cincinnati and to be able to pull out that game? What is your reflections on the whole situation? Well, I mean, it was a, it was a sad event. and. Yeah. Uh, Surely it affected every guy on that football team. And for them, uh, I think Jason Garrett, you have to take your hat off. He did a great job in the way he handled that whole situation. Uh, and those players all year long, they've gotten ready. They've come out and played every game. Right. And uh, 
how they did it last week, I don't know. But they came out and they fought and they scrapped the whole game and uh, were able to come away with a victory. But uh, that was a tough one. They showed a lot of uh, a lot of character in uh, in being able to do that. Yeah, and hopefully that can carry over into the next week against the Steelers, and then after that the Saints, then of course the Washington Redskins, right? Well, I hope so, Drew. You yeah. know, I think uh, you know. This has been a year with the Cowboys. I mean, everybody started off with that big game in New York. They're right. thinking, okay, they're going to come out and they're just going to roll over everybody they play. And it just hasn't worked out that way. But, you know, this team has gotten better. And Jason Garrett, you know, some people get him under fire for the way he's coaching and the way he approaches. I think he's doing an excellent job. And it would make me happy to see them win the next three games and win the division, hopefully if New York loses, and get in the playoffs and be able to do something there. That, yeah, that would be fabulous. That would be nice because yes. it would shut a lot of people up, a lot of critics, including yes. myself. Yes. You know, I oh, criticize that. <laughs> but well, like I said. Well, that's normal. Everybody, like I said, I mean, we're all guilty of it to some right. certain extent, but we're still Cowboy fans. We still love them. We still pull for them. We still want them to win, and, and I would – I'd like to beat them, to, them to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers first. Yes, that that yes. would be good. Yeah, since we lost two Super Bowls Yeah, to them. we lost two Super Bowls. We can't be too critical. And that was one game you tried to return a, a, a kickoff, right? Remember did, that? Uh, you got to bring that up, right? You, know, I did, yeah, you, had, I, you had a cast on your hand or something, I broke right? my thumb, and, and I was in the wedge, and Jarella Squibb kicked the ball, and I was a running back in high school, so I had a flashback. I picked it up. I had it in my right hand. It switched it to the left hand. It was broke. And do you know who was it that hit me on that play to make me fumble? No. That was a trivia question somewhere. Was okay. Tony Dungy? Tony Dungy? Tony Dungy was a linebacker for the Steelers. Oh, He's the wow. one that hit me and made me fumble that ball. Oh yeah. man, look at Dungy now. You wouldn't think he could hurt anybody, no, right? No, he'd hurt himself. <laughs> <laughs> but that's your first and only time of carrying a ball in the NFL, right? Yeah, I had an interception, one interception oh, okay. in 14 years for a minus <laughs> one yards. But I did intercept Joe Montana, so. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You watch these Cowboys, you know what we went through back in the day. Uh, what do you miss about the old days that you don't see in today's NFL game? Well, Drew, I think the game has changed. The money has gotten so much bigger, and uh, they've changed the rules uh, to, to really, how would you have liked to play today? Huh. Easy. Where I mean, the shots you used to take, you, right. you you took your life in your hands going across the middle. Right. Today, these guys don't have to worry about that because if somebody just so much as touches them in the head, I mean, <laughs> they're going to get a 15-yard penalty and they're liable to get fined for hundred thousand dollars. Right. So right. Uh, you know, from that standpoint, the game has changed to a certain extent, and maybe it's for the better that they're protecting these players. Uh, you know, I know rushing the quarterback. You watch that, and you know. I mean, these guys have to hesitate a little bit because, you know, if, if you hit the quarterback in his knees, even if somebody shoves you into it, it's a 15-yard penalty. Yeah. But you watch the games every week. You have to talk about them. I, I do the same thing. But it still boils down to winning the line of scrimmage, Drew. Right. It's, right. it's all in the offensive and defensive line. I mean, yes, you need your wide receivers to make your big plays and your quarterback, but they can't show their talents off if the guys up front don't do the job for them offensively. And it's hard to win a game now with, with all these rules. I mean, you can't cover a guy for six or eight seconds anymore. You gotta have a pass rush to disrupt that quarterback's timing. So that's what I see as changes in the game. But the thing that's remained constant is that when games won most of the time in the offensive and defensive line. Yeah, there's no question. It's what's up front that counts. And I used to beg <laughs> Rayfield Neely and Blaine Nye and all them guys. When I ran that 16 route, yeah. give me a little extra time, yeah, please. Because I'm a little slow. I need to work downfield to get to get open for Roger. But uh, you mentioned some of the things you're doing now, business and all this other stuff. Uh, you're also involved with some charities. Is that correct? Well, Drew, I, I'm... Uh... I've done some charity stuff over the years. Uh, right now, I really don't have one charity that, that I'm involved with. Uh, I have a uh, sister-in-law that has ALS, so I've done some stuff with the ALS uh, charities, which is, which is a good cause. And, you know, anytime you get a chance, Drew, to, to give back, it's been a great life for me, and, and I've been very blessed. And 
you know, when somebody asks me to get involved with a, with a charitable event or organization, if I can do it, I surely try to do it. Yeah. And you're out there, you're visible out there. You do a lot of public uh, appearances and things of that nature, don't you? Yeah. I still pay, stay pretty busy doing uh, appearances, uh, a few speaking events like we've done together. Right. Uh, you know, some autograph sessions. So, you know, I, like I said, I've had a blessed life and, uh, you know, I still have the opportunity to do those type of things. Well, the only time I really get to see is when we do those things and we <laughs> show up at the same place. Well, we need we're, to see each other more than <laughs> hey, don't we, Drew? <laughs> it's good money, right? <laughs> yeah. But also, when, I, when you come and do the Drew Pearson show, I get to see as the, then as well. So we appreciate you taking the time to be our special guest this evening, and please come back and join us again sometime. I Ladies and gentlemen, it. the great Randy White on the Drew Pearson show. And we'll be back with more of the Drew Pearson Show right after this. <laughs> all right, all right. Welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. I'm joined with my co-host, Paul Southen. As you know, reviewing movies, and he reviewed another one. Tell us about it, Paul. Yeah, this one's called This Is 40. It's the uh, the sort of sequel to Knocked Up, is what they're calling it. And the director, Judd Apatow, who's done Knocked Up, Superbad, and a bunch of great films. We got to sit down with them here at the Ritz-Carlton in Dallas and uh, talk about the film, because essentially, all these films he's writing about life, they're so close to home for him. In fact, he's got his wife and his kids in the movie. So it's really a family affair, and he's got Paul Rudd playing him. Wow. So it's a really, really interesting and honest movie, and uh, I think it'll be a pretty big hit. But uh, yeah, let's take a look at the interview, and here is Judd Apatow. Well, welcome to Dallas. We're really happy to have you here for This is 40. Now, this is a movie I feel like there are a lot of themes that are so important to people that we really just don't get to see in film. Why do you mm -hmm. suppose that is? Uh, I don't know. I think that uh, everyone's decided that movies need to work internationally. Mm -hmm. So that means a lot more action and spectacle. And uh, it, I, I think they take less risks about movies, just about normal people. But you know, Universal really was into the movie and very supportive. And they've been supportive of all the things that I've been trying to do you know, in film. But it is, it is a shame that there aren't you know, a lot of movies uh, without robots. I like robots, don't get me wrong. I, just, I think they should be in a small portion of movies, not all the yeah. movies. Yeah, well, and you were able to leave the robots out and it was still yes. a great movie. Yes. So. <laughs> well, and, and this is uh, something that, it's uh, the sort of sequel to yes. Knocked Up is the tagline, but um, had you been thinking about this since Knocked Up? Like, where could these characters go? Or is it something that with a few extra years you were thinking about, where would they be? I, you know, I didn't think about it at all. I, I never thought I would make a sequel to anything. I, I was just trying to think of a movie about family. I thought, I, I should probably make a movie about you know what it feels like being a dad and how hard it is to have a relationship over the long haul and just all the issues that seem to overwhelm Leslie and I during the day. And then I thought, I guess I'd do it with Leslie and Paul. I, I mean, I was thinking of other people's names and and then I, I thought, oh, it'd be pretty cool to like, see my daughters five, six years after Knocked Up. Like, that's the kind of thing I like in movies. Like, oh my God, I saw that kid in that movie and now they grow up and they act like that in this movie. Um, and, and I like the idea of you know, a family that really loves each other on screen, where it doesn't feel like people pretending to love each other, that you could just see in their interactions that it's, it, it's, it's intimate in a way that movies never are. Yeah, well, and I think that's one of the fantastic things about it. But I gotta think as a director, well, seeing your wife and your kid, you know, yeah. being a family affair could be great, but it could also be uh, Yeah, it could have been a nightmare. I mean, it literally could, I mean, if the movie was terrible, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a worldwide humiliation for my my children and my wife, <laughs> and so it, it is a little bit, uh, you know, to make a movie like this is a, is a reckless act. But I don't know, when I listen to m music, if I listen to something like you know, Nirvana, I always think, oh, he's not kidding. He's really like sharing his heart with me. And you can tell with certain artists, oh, they're, they're, they're telling their story to you. And, and that's the type of, you know, creativity that I appreciate the most. So it's... I got sucked into giving it a shot. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of the dialogue seems to come from you or from mm. what people know mm. of you. Mm -hmm. So do you really feel like Paul Rudd is playing a version of you in a sense? Uh, you know, it really is a morph between his attitudes and my attitudes. And if you created a weird Judd Paul Frankenstein monster, how irritating he would be to Leslie. 
so it really isn't exactly me or exactly him, and it's very, it's very much a, a heightened situation. I, I, you know, in a, in a movie to be funny, you usually have to show people at their worst. Mm -hmm. You know, if if they're getting along great, there's no movie. Uh, it, you know, it's fun to watch the the hard stuff. But you have no desire to be in front of the camera, right? Uh, not really. I mean, I can't say it won't happen at some point. I am a ham, but I'm also a terrible actor, and that's a bad combination. Uh, but, but you know, there are people who are much more qualified than me that people actually want to see. Yeah. And and the thing is that this this film is as some people probably don't expect it's close to two and a half hours, mm -hmm. but it's a very engaging yeah. two and a half mm -hmm. hours. And w yeah. was there a concern about that? Because most people think of comedies yeah. closer to hour and a half. Yeah, I mean, I never even think of these as comedies. I, I I do think of them as dramas with a lot of humor. You know, it's the movie's two hours and thirteen minutes. So I always think, you know, that extra twenty minutes that's free. You know, you don't pay for that. I mean, I I, I never understand why people. Uh, you know, want everything short. Yeah. Movies are expensive, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a pain in the ass to you know, get the family together and get parking and get the popcorn and be mad at how much the soda costs. And you know, we could sit for ten more minutes and try to know more about these people. Um, and it's a half hour shorter than The Hobbit. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, that's both uh, a rationalization for my film and uh, and uh, me tipping my hat at The Hobbit for having the, the courage to go another 30 minutes past me. Well, last thing, what was your best memory on the set? Because you're there with your family. Uh -huh. Surely there's something years from now you're gonna look back on and go, yeah. that was a great day. Uh, I mean, one of the best days was the day where Maud has a scene where she has to yell and cry and curse out her parents. And it's, you know, it's kind of a, an emotional scene, but it's also really funny. And it was like watching a person fall in love with acting. You could see she had put it all together how to do this. And sometimes in the movie theater, people will applaud at the end of the scene. And so, you know, I'm very proud of her. Good. Well, congratulations to you and your family, Alice. Oh. It's great that you're able to do this and, and share it with the world. I know maybe it might be a little tough. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, thank All you right, for your time. Care. Hey, thanks. All right. What a great time we had tonight. Great lineup for the Drew Pearson Show. I want to thank all my special guests, Mayor Masso from the city of Frisco, Jeremy Werner, Olympic gold medalist, and the great Randy White was with us tonight. And uh, right here at Kelly's, the Drew Pearson Show. So next week, I'm looking forward to it. We'll have another great show for you. And so stay tuned always to the Drew Pearson Show. See you next week. Yeah.